mind so that I can uh, open the meeting. Okay. Okay. Welcome to this afternoon session of the ELD MOOC. Welcome to this um, for a fifth session of about how to do a cost benefit analysis. I would like to welcome all of you and particularly our uh, distinguished speaker, Professor Hans Hurni of the University of Bern in Switzerland. I am your host today. I am Claudia Musekamp. I'm the online tutor uh, for this ELD MOOC. And I've met many of you uh, online already and also in the past live sessions. Uh, we will have about uh, an hour of presentation. And as, in, as you've experienced in the other meetings, we'll take your questions in the chat or towards the end of the presentation, uh, also via audio. Um, before I hand over to today's speaker, I would uh, like to ask you um, about your experience with uh, cost benefit, cost benefit analysis being um, today's topic. Uh, oh, there, oh, there seems to be an issue with uh, polling uh, too. So um, we we draw we leave it as it is, and. Um, I will introduce you to uh, today's uh, speaker. Uh, in the last past uh, weeks of the ELD MOOC, we have learned about ecosystem services and how to value those uh, in terms of marketed good, but also in terms of goods and services that haven't been marketed so far. And uh, what we have learned is that those methods help, help us um, making decisions. They help us if uh, there is a choice. And uh, today you will learn uh, how to do a cost benefit analysis in uh, economics of land degradation. Uh, and I am uh, very glad uh, to be able to introduce to you Professor Dr. Hans Hurni of the Universities of Bern, Center for Development and Environment. He has a long standing experience in that field and also particularly in Ethiopia. And he will guide us through um, um, a current study uh, on the Ethiopian Highland. Welcome with me, Professor Hans Hurni. Welcome, Claudia. Welcome to the rest. Good morning in America. It's earlier than you thought. A good day in Africa. It's also earlier than you thought. And good evening in Asia, which is good for you because you can join us before the night really falls in. My name is Hans Hurni. You have heard it. We already talked to each other a little bit. And actually, we don't even need a poll because uh, you have asked, you have given me answers to the question that I asked, namely about Ethiopia and what it means to you. And I'm appreciative of what you know. You know a lot about it. Now, unfortunately, I'm not so knowledgeable about cost-benefit analysis, Claudia. You promised a lot by saying I would tell everybody how to do a cost-benefit analysis in ELD and uh, even in the title of my presentation. I will rather talk to you about the problems of doing such an analysis and about the challenges of doing it and about the opportunities of doing it for a country that has been heavily hit by land degradation, the Ethiopian highlands. And that's the main topic of today. Um, the ELD project, you know it as well as I do in the past, the scope of our project is within the ELD initiative. It's an ELD funded project. 
Our scope is about soil degradation, less land degradation, so that which, which I mean not so much forest degradation, wildlife degradation, vegetation degradation. No, we focus on soil degradation because soil degradation is something which is quite irreversible if you... So we need sustainable land management and particularly in rain-fed agriculture, which is the case all over the Ethiopian highlands. It's not irrigated, it's rain-fed. Farmers depend on rainfall and they use the rains to grow crops and livestock, which is also living up in the highlands, needs rains to get grass for eating. So rain-fed agriculture is the center of our study. The Ethiopian highlands, you know a lot about it. Me too, I have been there for many, many years. 40 years now is an anniversary. I, I came to Ethiopia in 1974, just into the middle of a drought and famine situation. And I was, of course, heavily shocked. And 10 years later, 1984, when a second drought hit the highlands very heavily, I was still there working in soil and water research. So I'm really uh, uh, um, passionate about Ethiopia and I like to work there still today and even in the future. Now, our project is a chance. We got some money from the ELD initiative to do uh, an economic analysis of soil management in Ethiopia at multiple scales, from the local to the national scale. And when we presented this to our colleagues in Addis Abeba, they were quite astonished, how could we do that? Is it possible to zoom in and zoom out like on Google Earth and still get economic valuations on each level of looking at? And we said, yes, we can do it. Uh, maybe we promise too much, but let me tell you more in detail now. So the strategic focus is threefold. You see three sentences, the first one being, we want to provide a spatially explicit model for cost-benefit analysis. And that was new to our colleagues. It was new because normally economists, they work with cases, with typical cases. But we want to make a georeferenced case. We want to tell for every point in the landscape of the Ethiopian highlands, what are costs and benefits of sustainable land management there on that spot. Second scope, second focus is we want to define further inputs for modeling the total economic value, TEV, of the Ethiopian highlands, which has much more to do with land and vegetation and wildlife and nature than just about soils. And third and last focus is informing decision makers about best options for SLM and also sustainable water management in Ethiopia. And when I say decision makers, then I can tell you that three ministers are closely following up our work in Ethiopia, the Minister of Water, the Minister of Agriculture, and the Minister of Science and Technology. So we are carefully observed. We have to take care that we present something that is useful to them, to their activities, because the ministries have the responsibility of supporting farmers at the end. And so farmers need SLM to improve their living situations. But is that economic? That is our big question still now. When we look at the Ethiopian highlands from far, from sky, then you see in the, in the middle of this picture, you see Lake Victoria. When you look down on the lower end, you, see, you even see Kilimanjaro from top. And when you look a little up, you see the Red Sea because we are looking from the equator to the north. You see the Red Sea, you see the Arabic Peninsula just on the border of the earth and in front on the African continent, you see something which is greener than the rest. This is the Ethiopian highlands. And unlike many people who believe Ethiopia is dry, Emma just said, 
As Addis Abeba is very, very dry. It's in the Rift Valley. You see the Rift Valley crossing this highland park. But Addis Abeba is quite wet. It's not even dry. it's not even moist. It's wet. You may have happened to be there in the dry season when it's really dry, but only for about three months. So the Ethiopian highlands, they are where I put the circle here. And the funny thing is that in this circle, there are as many people living as in the whole rest of the Sahel zone throughout to, to, the, to the west, to the end of the Sahara. As many people, namely about 85 to 90 million people live under this circle. Incredible. The density of population is 10 times as high and as in the rest of the Sahel. However, these people are still living in the Sahel zone, but they are more favored with more rainfall than the rest of the Sahel. Higher rainfall does not mean it's more reliable. The rainfall is highly variable. And if a drought hits this place under a circle, as many people are affected as in the rest of the Sahel together. And that's why Ethiopia is also often known as a country full of famine. When we look on a map, this is an agroecological map of Ethiopia, you see green and gray as colors. The green parts are the highland parts, are the parts above 1,500 meters above sea level, while the gray parts are the parts that are lowlands. Lowlands being between about 500 meters above sea level down to minus 150 meters below sea level. So this, these are really extreme deserts where there is hardly any rainfall. So almost everybody lives in the highlands and that makes them so vulnerable also to population pressure. You see here a typical highland picture uh, from Wollo, around 2,500 meters above sea level, and it's green. It's in the middle of the rainy season. It's at the time when crops are growing, but still the grasses are not yet growing so well, so it must be at the beginning of the rainy season. But in principle, everything which is green on this picture is cultivated land. And if you are from a plane, if you are from Canada, if you are from uh, Germany somewhere, you are not normally experiencing such steep slopes for agriculture, for cultivated land, which means these lands are exposed to the rains. And if it's not terraced, farmers have a problem to keep their soil in place. And that's a basic problem of the Ethiopian highlands. And the agricultural system in Ethiopia is very traditional. Still today, plowing is with oxen, a pair of oxen with a very simple iron peaked wooden plow on steepest slopes here up to elevations of 3,600 meters above sea level. By the way, this is inside a national park. I happen to have worked as a warden, as a head of a national park in the 1970s. So this is a picture near my house at that time. A place which should be reserved for wildlife, but farmers have been forced into this area due to a lack of land. And by the way, there were good soils, so they have re deforested, they have taken away the forest, they burnt it at elevations up to nearly 4,000 meters above sea level, and they are now cultivating it. And you can imagine, they have sufficient rainfall. There was no need to retain water. They even are happy if the water goes, but the water doesn't go alone. It goes with soil. And so after many decades of land use, the soil here is washed down. It ends in the rivers. Part of it ends in Sudan and another part ends in the Aswan Dam nowadays. Earlier, it was fertilizing the Egyptian agriculture. Nowadays, it's no more like this. So the, 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 the soil that is washed down is remaining in many reservoirs and dams and reduces the lifespans of these dams. So sediment 
have become not a source of fertilizer, but a source of economic uh, cost. And that is something in a total economic valuation has to be included. When the rainy season is over and crops are harvested, then everybody is happy. Uh, people are marrying because they have enough food. So they are threshing here. And you can see that the system of agriculture is really simple, handmade, a lot of manual labor, a, a lot of la livestock labor on the left side. Uh, the, the grains are separated from the straw by trampling of animals and then throwing it into the sky. The wind will separate the two. The grains fall faster than the rest. And so everything is handmade. And that's why 85% of the Ethiopian population of 90 million are farmers. At an incredible amount. Farming, farming, farming everywhere. And that's why uh, one has to find solutions to the rural development of Ethiopia. In the lowlands now, when we go to the gray area of the map you have seen before, in the lowlands, uh, no more cultivation, no more livestock, uh, cattle livestock, but livestock in the form of camels, maybe donkeys, maybe mules transporting so there is a pastoralist way of life which i cannot touch upon in this in this lecture because it is a totally different topic let's go on when we got this eld initiative on working on our side we immediately made a meeting and that was in january in addis ababa where we have assembled a team of specialists that help us to carry out this analysis in the next uh, six months until July 2014, we have to finish it. So we invited economists in the foreground. You see Dr. Cassier of CIMIT. Cassier is one of our key people. He is an economist with a, an agricultural background. And Cassier has published many, many cost-benefit analysis case studies on Ethiopia in his past record. Cassie is now in Nairobi, but we invited him to come and help us, and he was willingly doing it. When you look into the ELD homepage, you see on Ethiopia there are as many as 14 cost-benefit analyses listed, which shows that Ethiopia is probably the country with most of cost-benefit analysis so far. And uh, Cassier published four out of these 14. So it, it, it was due to his activity. He was excited by our approach because he said he never did this um, geospatial, large scale, pixel based analysis of cost and benefits of land management. So he, he gladly joined in. We, however, said cost benefit is only one side. We actually work towards total economic value. And you know the uh, definition. It's about use value, direct, indirect option, and non-use value as well. So we said our case study in the Ethiopian Highlands should serve direct use value through agricultural, crop, and livestock production, but at the same time be a database for indirect use value. Through water, for example, the water delivery to Sudan, to the Nile, to Egypt is extremely important because lowland irrigation is highly dependent on highland water uh, delivery. We also want to look at the option value for ecotourism and biodiversity, wildlife conservation, and even the non-use value as opposed to the use value because to see whether what is delivered downstream is better or less good if the upstream would not be used for agricultural purposes. So we have a, a real big, a big goal of that study. But until July, we may only do the first point out of the four options that are offered here. Very concretely, we do a cost-benefit analysis, all costs and benefits associated with action, with SLM, with soil and water conservation, 
and compare it to business as usual farming. That means farming without such actions. Spatially explicit. That means everywhere in the Ethiopian highlands, we want to know the direct agricultural use of land, costs and benefits of past soil and water conservation action, but maybe they were not sufficient. We want to know costs and benefits of optimum sustainable land management action, not just some soil and water conservation, but really uh, soil and water conservation that pays back to the farmer, that pays back to the next generation, and that makes sense for the government to support and compare it with business as usual, costs and benefits. This is the basic behind our study. But spatially explicit, what does it mean? We said if we do it, we want to do it as good as possible, almost to the scale of, let's say, Google Earth pictures. That means we want to do a pixel-based approach. Pixel-based meaning each piece of land in the highlands, which is 30 by 30 meters square, we want to look at particularly for that pixel. I will use the word pixel many times. One hectare, you probably know what it is, 10, uh, 100 by 100 meters. So there are 10 pixels on every hectare. Or per square kilometer, we want to look at 1,000 such pieces of land. Or for the highlands, which are about 500,000 square kilometers, we will look at 500 million individual pixels of land and do cost-benefit analysis for each of the 500 million pixels. This is crazy, you will say. Okay, let us be crazy, that's fun also. But before that, I want to show you what erosion does to Ethiopia. This is a piece of cultivated land. And I tell you, every piece of land which is cultivated in Ethiopia looks more or less like this in the rainy season. It is exposed to the rain. There are no grasses to protect that soil. Cultivating means removing weed, removing grasses, making it ready for crops. But during that period before it is growing and after it has been plowed, at the onset of the rainy season, you get extreme rates of soil erosion. And part of it, maybe 20%, 10%, 30% of it reaches the rivers. This is the small Abai, the small Blue Nile. Not a big river up in the highlands, but you see how much soil it is carrying in the water. So we look into that one. And why that river? You know, this river is part of the Nile system. The Blue Nile brings 50% of the water of the Na Lake Nasser at the Aswan. Half of that water which reaches the Aswan comes from the Blue Nile, from the Abai River, how it is called in Ethiopia. So this is the biggest share of all rivers of the Nile is the Abai River. And this Abai not just brings 50% of the water, but about 90% of the sediments. And so if we manage to improve land in the catchment of the Apai, the Blue Nile, we may, be we may be able to reduce the total sediment load of the Nile, which, event we will, which will eventually fill the reservoirs downstream. So that is our challenge. But the challenge is also on the spot, on the pixel, on each farmer's fields. You see here the white parts are parts where approximately one meter of soil has been eroded since farmers have started to cultivate the land. And I tell you, this is not a special picture from some selected site. It is rather a typical picture of the Ethiopian hills at the beginning of the rainy season. So it is shocking. 
because on the white parts of this landscape, you cannot produce anymore. So eventually, when the soil depth is zero, the yield is also zero. Pixels that are on these white fields do not have any more crop productivity. And that is something economically that we have to take into account. I'm now summarizing. I'm almost in the middle of my presentation. These are the six plus one steps that are proposed by ELD and by UNCCD in their methodology 2013. And we have now gone through one to five, more or less. We know the scope, location, spatial scale, strategic focus of the study. We have seen some geographical characteristics, geographical in the human sense, geographical in the uh, population sense, geographical in the topography, landscape sense. And of course, that we must have much more information on ecological and social characteristics of each of our 500 million pixels of the highlands. There are many types of ecosystem services on these pixels, but also throughout. You know them, you know, there are the supporting services that maintain the ecosystem uh, by itself. But since most of the highlands are used for provisioning services, for providing food, providing feed for animals, providing fibers for clothing, providing fuel for, for biofuels, why not? But these provisioning services are endangered if the supporting services of these ecosystems are not maintained. And of course, we have a regulation function of each and every pixel, regulating water flow, regulating biodiversity, and so on. And we have the cultural functions. Landscapes are beautiful for visitors. They are also beautiful for farmers, beautiful for religious traditions, and so on. So many, many ecosystem services that are globally listed can be found in the Ethiopian highlands. It's in fact a nice place to live. And no wonder uh, that, that we all love to work in Ethiopia. The role of these services, we will look at a little more, but they are extremely important for the livelihoods of these 85% of the population. When a country has so many farmers, these farmers almost fully rely on natural resources. So it's an extreme case of ELD analysis. And land degradation is also extreme. We have seen it. And there is immense pressure on the land, which we also have to look at. Now, before taking action at the end, let's now look a little closer into the cost benefit. And of course, on these pixels, we need to know how much water is going off it, how much soil is going with that water. For each and every pixel, we have to apply a model that at the end, when we look at cascades of pixels, when it ends in the river, we should also be able to calibrate our models. Let me go here. Calibrate our models. So this we did by monitoring runoff and monitoring soil and sediment loss in rivers in these small catchments. We did it in many places throughout the highlands. I started it in 1981 and my colleagues in Ethiopia have taken it over when I returned back to the University of Bern, but I'm still backstopping. And I can tell you some of the persons that you see standing on, these, uh, on this small bridge, they are still working there after 33 years doing this job carefully and for science purposes, very, very usefully. In 10,000s of storms, we have monitored that one, which is now a very good basis for our assessment. And you see it on this picture. That's a, a, a test plot, 15 meters long, two meters wide, 
on the left and right side, there is maize growing. In the middle, we didn't allow the farmer to grow maize. And immediately, rills are forming when it rains. That means when the soil is not covered with vegetation, it is terrible for that soil. Then you quickly lose one meter of soil in few decades. I say decades because it's not going in one year. It may be going in 50 years, in 60 years, in 100 years, if you don't take care. So there is not no immediate urgency, but the problem is that most of this soil has been exposed too long. Agriculture in Ethiopia is old. It is 1,000, 2,000, 3,000, 5,000 years old. We found it out with dating of carbon, charcoal, from the first burning of forest, we found that charcoal deep in the soil. We dated it and we found out agriculture is between 1,000 and 5,000 years old in the Ethiopian highlands. But it's still going on. So the soils were not immediately destroyed because Ethiopia had fewer people, fewer farmland. Look at this picture. This is a study by Dr. Gete Zeleke, who did his PhD on it. He looked at the distribution of land use in 1957 of an area which is about 100 square kilometers. And you see the dark color, quite a lot of forest is existing in 1957. Cropland is also quite dominant already then. And that's somewhere in the grain basket of Ethiopia. You see on the photo to the left, there is a lot of grain land. The yellow parts are croplands in 1984. Now, if you compare this to the situation 40 years on, and now look at the picture with the forest color. 40 years on, these forests have almost gone. You see only very little forests, a lot of cultivated land, cropland. Even the grassland, if I go back, was more in 1957 than it is now in 1995. And since then, that situation more or less stabilized because farmers did not allow young families to go and, and cultivate grassland because they said we need it for our animals. Animal feed is important. And even the government has afforestate part of it. You see the, the purple uh, color. These are afforestations. But compared with 1957, the afforestations are not big. So Bringing back the forest is probably not possible, but we should take care that the soil is not going because otherwise these people will lose their land. These are the set of technologies that we were proposing for the Ethiopian highlands. And you see there are many, many technologies, intercropping, alley cropping, area closure. That means non-use value of that land, afforestation, Soil and water micro basins, cut off drains, waterways to drain excess water, buns, fanyaju, grass strips, controlled grazing, gully reclamation. There is a lot that can be done, but everything is at a cost, you see? And that's the problem. This costing and the benefits for farmers or for society have to be assessed for each and every piece of land throughout. And this was not without action. As far back as 1983, we initiated government programs to take place in research catchments. You see them here, buns. The white spots you see are actually people working on bunding. And they did this bunding in 1983 using food for work programs. And you may know it, what it means. It means that farmers, are compensated with grain and oil for work they do on their land for a certain purpose, like soil and water conservation in this place here. However, these farmers were doing it against payment. So we have realized they were not really interested about these buns because these buns, they take away good land. You cannot cultivate on the buns. And so, you lose part of your cultivation, which means an economic loss. 
you may gain something against degradation, but you don't gain something immediately. And so we were afraid that a lot of these structures may be destroyed. And in fact, many were destroyed. But in this particular case, you will see on the next picture, I just found it last week on Google Earth, the same picture. Google Earth, I tried to zoom in. I didn't manage very well, but almost the same piece of land 30 years on in 2012. It looked the same. When I go back and I go forward again, these structures were maintained over a long period of time and they have helped to reduce soil erosion. Now, how much is that reduction? Or is soil still being washed away? Yes, it is. As you see on this picture, between two bands, there is one on the top left and one just coming to, to, towards us. You see that the bands are there, but there is erosion in between. But the soil that comes with the water is being deposited behind the band and only part of it goes on. So when we calculate economically cost benefits, we have to look at such deposition and how terraces are being formed with such depositions. Actually, this is a cheap way of making a terrace by letting erosion work for you. So erosion, while you develop terraces, can also be a benefit. And that the water goes on is actually good for Sudan and Egypt because they need the water, which is excess in the highlands, but is not existing in Sudan and Egypt. So we needed to find systems where soil is retained, but water is still going. Quite a challenging task, I can tell you. But at the end, when you look closer into it, we found out that after 20 years already, some nice terraces developed out of these small bunds that were initially done by the farmers. Nice terraces, the impact is there, hardly any more erosion on the cultivated land and the crops are quite nicely because some water is also retained and helps the growth of these crops. Now, how do we use this in an economic evaluation? You see here a cross section a cutting through such a terrace. And you see, in fact, it is not so simple. Part of this terrace is better than before, namely the top part where there is deep soil now. Part is like before, like without terracing. And on the backside of a terrace, when there is this uh, topsoil erosion arrow, there is less yield, 84% against 100% and against 120%. But what is worse even, in between such terraces, some part cannot be cultivated anymore. So there is a loss of land, as I said. So our big question is, in the catchment, in the whole watershed, is this conservation beneficial or is it not? And we have done monitoring over many years like on this catchment, 110 hectares um, over uh, a period from 1981 to 2002, we looked at the total grain and total biomass production of the whole catchment. We monitored it. And you see the red arrow. That is the time when soil and water conservation was introduced. It was immediately followed by 1984 drought, where there was hardly any grain, hardly any biomass. You see the two points are very near each other and way down. But all in all, biomass has steadily increased over the last 20 years and grain also, which means introducing such measures are eventually beneficial, at least when you compare them with the loss of of soil that otherwise would happen if you wouldn't have done it. And this brings me back to our assessment. We made four components in January. We decided on four components. We said, if we want to characterize 500 million pixels in the Ethiopian highland, each of them individually, you cannot go from pixel to pixel. That's clear. So we need to combine remote sensing with GIS, 
technology with observations and statistics of yields that are done by the government, with modeling of soil erosion that has been done by us, by modeling the effectiveness of SLM structures, which can be done by us, by looking what has been done on a remotely sensed way. So we had four components. The first one, we decided to do a careful land cover classification at high resolution on a national scale. High resolution means to the pixel. We know for each of the 30 by 30 meters, is it cultivated? Is it grazed? Is it uh, not used because it's too arid? So it depends on the agroclimatic zone where it, this pixel is found. And the team, they found a methodology how to do it. And I can tell you, this is probably the first and only one for the whole of Africa, if not the world, where grassland can be separated from cultivated land. Any, everybody who works with remote sensing knows it is easy to classify forests. It is fairly easy to find uh, irrigation areas, but it is very difficult to differentiate in rain-fed agriculture what is grazed and what is cultivated because that depends on the season. Sometimes you may see the difference because one is plowed, the other one is not. But when everything grows, when the crops is growing, then you don't see the difference anymore. So that is a component where five people were engaged and they have been working since January up to now, and they have nearly finished their classification. Another team led by one of my PhD students made, oh, by the way, component one is also led by one of my PhD students, Tibebo, thank you very much for doing it. The component two is also done by one of my PhD students, Asnake from Bahadar University in Ethiopia. He found a methodology using Google Earth to detect automatically existing terraces on the land, automatic mapping. Asnake will come next week to do his PhD exam and he will pass, that's for sure. And at the same time, he is now working in component two. For each and every pixel, tell us how many terraces are on these fields. He is able to do it only where he has high resolution Google Earth access. And that's not the case for all of Ethiopia, just about half of the islands. But nevertheless, we get a good indication from him. Component three is the modeling where I have most experience, the relationship of soil erosion to crop yield. We do that with many models. I will just show you how, but this is component, a common component where we feel quite fit and we can do it in, uh, within the next two months. Component four, I have to rely on Dr. Cassier. Uh, Menale will do the evaluation of the costs of soil degradation and the economics of SLM practices together with his Ethiopian colleague, Berhane. The two will do the economic evaluation, the economic valuation even, cost-benefit calculation based on our figures for each and every pixel where it is in space. And that's quite exciting for an economist. He said he never did it before. So we are looking forward so that we can finally discuss livelihood options under this component then. And this will be a big step forward from what has been done so far. There have been studies like this one showing you uh, how uh, 200 kilometer, that's the scale you see on this picture on the left. They were using a population density mapping, but their squares are quite large. They are, they are five by five kilometers each square on that picture on the left, on that map on the left side. Whereas on each of these 25 square kilometers, we will have 25,000 squares. So we are refining this map on the left by a factor one to 25,000. And on the right side, the pixels are much sw smaller. They are one square kilometer. We are still refining even this map by a factor 1,000. There will be 1,000 pixels 
on each of the small points. So we will be providing a database which allows the Nile Basin Initiative, which did these maps, or the Ethiopian government, the ministries of water, of agriculture, of science and technology, to zoom in via internet and to find out for each and every place what we have been able to collect. Just an example. That's from the uh, component of, of land use classification. You see the pixels now are much smaller because the map shown here is only about two kilometers wide, 600 meters, you see the bar. So we can compare with high resolution Google Earth and we found out our assessment is good. We can really differentiate between grassland, bare land, cultivated land, bushland, shrubland, about 22 categories of land use. So we will be able to really go into detail. And on the figure below, we see we can automatically map the quality of soil and water conservation structures in one of the places, but all over Ethiopia, wherever we have high resolution Google Earth pictures. Thank you, Google Earth, for helping us in doing that, that work. We really love you for that. Now, the modeling will be a little more be a little bit more complicated. You see here the relationship between crop yield on the vertical with soil depth on the horizontal. So for every pixel we need to know soil depth, we need to know in which agroecology this is situated. We need to know whether it's hot and dry or whether it's cold and moist, what crop basket is growing. And this here is an example, example number 23 of many, many we have developed of a middle altitudinal zone, which is favorable for everything, which has been treated with uh, soil conservation, Fania Ju, we call it. In Swahili, this is throwing uphill, making buns above the ditch. And so we see when, when the soil is deep, 80 centimeters or more, we think the crop yield can be nice, 2.8 tons per hectare, which is 28 quintal per hectare. That's a nice crop, even under subsistence agricultural conditions. In case this is modernized with fertilizer and so on, it can even be raised. But currently 28 or 2.8 tons per hectare would be a nice result for the farming family. However, when soils get thinner, this will be reduced to nearly zero when there is no more soil. So if we find on a piece of land some 40 centimeters of soil, this crop base, uh, crop basket, with a yield of less than 15 quintals or less than 1.5 tons per hectare, and even less. So it is going down. And this is one of the models we apply according to pixels, according to agroecology throughout the whole highlands. And then again, back to my pixels, you know, these 30 by 30 meters. You may find some land cover, cultivated land. You may find on a steeper slope, that's the below block diagram, you may find one conservation structure which has been traditionally applied. So we want to know what is the erosion from that? What, is tradi what has traditionally been done there? And what is the yield at that time? This is what we will do as a, a, a factor for productivity, as uh, Kunutur is also rightly chatting at the moment. So this relationship we want to use as one input factor into our modeling. Steep slopes dif differentiated from gentle slopes according to the local situation as we find it. And then, of course, in the past 40 years, there has been a lot of soil and water conservation carried out on some pixels. Only about 20% of the highlands in need of soil and water conservation has been treated so far. And this treatment may have been sufficient or not sufficient. So the brown ones were introduced with food for work. We will then be able to tell what is the effect of this fund. What is the effect on soil depth, the effect on crop yield? What labor was it costing to put two structures on a gentle and a steep slope? 
and what does, are the, uh, the long-term effects of it. So this is really helping us in long-term valuation, cost-benefit analysis of the pixels. That is now becoming more economic in your sense. And I'm already in my second last picture. You see, an optimum scenario will need maybe more of such structures. Maybe one more on a steep slope if you go back. And the structures have to become productive. That's why I greened them in this picture. Green structures mean bushes, trees, grasses being grown for feeding livestock, because that's the biggest problem of Ethiopian farmers. How do they get enough animal feed? And so this is a benefit of SLM technologies on their cultivated land. And it is a benefit to reduce soil erosion. It is a benefit to regulate water flow. And so it can be beneficial. And in our calculation, we are assessing all of this for uh, the 500 million pixels in the Ethiopian highlands. And when we have another webinar in about uh, three months, I'll be able to tell you the results. But I can tell you, that's my last picture. We will not stay at this. We will not just wait until we have the economic analysis. We are supporting farmers in Ethiopia to carry out soil and water conservation, to do sustainable land management technologies. We give them seeds of trees, of grasses, to grow something on their buns. And I can tell you, they are enthusiastically cooperating. And what is the best? no more food for work in our case. They are willing to do it on their own. They have seen their neighbors doing part of it. They have decided on their own to do it in their communities, even if the investment cost may, may never be paid back. And so our economic analysis, one of the scopes is to inform decision makers. We can inform them maybe also about the need to subsidize investment costs, because maintenance and keeping the bonds in place is something farmers can easily do. Maybe the investment is a bit too high for poorer families, for female-headed households, who, which have less work, labor force in their households. So it needs some social inputs, and that may be something even for the international cooperation but we want to be able to monetize not just for single cases, but for the Ethiopian highlands as a whole. Big goal. Let's see if we achieve it. We, you may be of help. That's all. Thank you very much for listening so far. Thank you, Hans, for a great presentation. Amazing on the, your work in the Ethiopian highlands. I think you have shown us, uh, given us a, fa a fabulous insight into your work and into what is important in Ethiopia and how uh, your scientific uh, work can help uh, better the livelihood of people. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you all for the good feedback I'm getting through the uh, chat. I'm always a little looking down to the chat corner. Thank you very much. Okay. Yes. Yeah. A lot of feedback coming in. There were some questions in the chat, and I've prepared some questions as well. I uh, saw questions from Navneet Kumar about. Um, the hydrological model and the land use uh, land use classification. You may want to take up those. Yes, shall I do it immediately now? Please. Okay. The land use classification, to start with the last, is uh, something we have developed a new methodolo methodology. You know, we normally used you may know the software eCognition that nobody else knows maybe, but eCognition is a, is a software you can apply to a satellite photo, a picture to the several bands, and then automatically it shows what land use is there, but it didn't work. 
we could separate forests from the rest we could identify grassland and cultivate plant that we needed for our economic valuation. And so we have to find a, a way of getting deeper into it. And our way is now partly manual. We make great regions of, of, um, of similar landscapes. And in there, we can automize it. So automatize it. That's what we do. And the methodology in detail, we intend to publish it in a review journal that will be one of the products of the EFD initiative project. The first question asked about the hydrological modeling. We, of course, have a lot of calibration data available. So we are very happy to test different models. And so far, uh, our SWOT approach, uh, SWOT modeling, that's a soil water, and water assessment tool, it developed in the United States, but then you need to adjust the parameters for Ethiopian conditions. That is something we calibrate with the help of our monitoring sites. And we validate it again with larger catchments that we have started to monitor a few years back. So we have a possibility, but this is not part of this study. This is part of a much larger study we are carrying out since uh, 33 years now. Okay. There was a question from Kunutur Srinivasa. Uh, what is the annual precipitation of the area? Um, I'm anxious to what I can say very quickly. It is from zero to 2,500 millimeters per year. Okay. I've seen one remark by Kunutur who says one could use different, no, not. not was saying that different seasonal images. Yes, we, we are using land that, and we are also using more. It's not, I'm technical, I'm sorry. These are different satellites, but their resolution is not so good, not as good as Google. Earth. They, they, they have a 30 meter resolution or 250 meter resolution, so they give only very uh, shabby of the landscape, unfortunately. Mm -hmm. And there was one more remark by Kunotur <coughs> about uh, sustainable land management and en en uh, envisages introduction of animal component. Sacha. Yes, you know, there are, there are almost as many heads of cattle, small ruminants, large livestock as people in Ethiopia. So every farm household has at least one oxen, not more than one, so they have to share, get two to get a pair for plowing. They have a donkey, they have a cow, they have a calf, they have three sheep, they have several goats. So there are as many people as livestock in Ethiopia. And that's one of the other problems. How do you feed not just food for people, but feed for livestock. That is part of our modeling. We look at the productivity of grassland, how much it brings for livestock feeding, and we are valuing economically the costs and benefits also of grassland. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, folks, we won't be able to take uh, questions via audio today, so please uh, post your question, write your questions in the chat box as many of you have done already and i will take uh, those questions uh, in um, and read them to um, our distinguished speaker today um surya having a question claudia she yes I, she. I, I saw that uh what is it what was the reason to uh, select Ethiopia? Because it's probably the country with the highest land degradation in the world. Very simple. Okay. I, was, I didn't apply for the ELD initiative, but then we were invited to come in and provide our results. We didn't even think of it. We were uh, so busy with other things. But I tell you now, I'm very happy to be with it. 
Okay, there's one question from Gertrude. So which are the factors you will take into account in calculating the benefits and the costs? I, I'm sorry, I was just reading. <laughs> I'm sorry. A question, uh, what, are, what are the factors you will take into account uh, in calculating benefits and costs? Now, I have to forward this to uh, ACM and our economists, but we virtually take all possible factors into account, which he already used in his previous studies. Labor cost, um, um, access cost, costs of placement cost, fertilizer, is when there are nutrient losses, costs to maintain, costs of erosion, how, how much uh, soil depth, reduce soil affects crop yields. We look at benefits, that means crop yields. We look at uh, water, how much clean water is getting out. So there are really uh, uh, about 20 or 30 factors. And we will we will publish the methodology of our ELD project very soon, as we have to finish it on time. Um, and then you can have access to it. Uh, the listing is a bit beyond my possibility. You know, I'm not an economist myself. I'm just happy to work with them. Okay. There are two questions related uh, to local people and labor. One is, did you involve the local people in monitoring soil erosion? That's number one. And the sec second is uh, how to capture labor cost since uh, a lot of work is done through uh, for free. Thank you very much um, for for uh, for involving people. I I just didn't mention it because it is so clear to me that you can only do things in a participatory way, and you, and it's always with people. The work, the discussion, even the stud topics we are applying a transdisciplinary methodology. That means we are not only working with social, economic, uh, engineering, and physical scientists, different professions. We, we once had 24 disciplines involved. We also work beyond science. We are applying um, a participatory way of including local knowledge in all our activities. So we have, over the past 40 years, we have learned so much from local knowledge, from people they have told us what we have to look at. They have told us what are benefits, what are costs. They have opened our minds all the time. And for us, it is a standard to get a transdisciplinary workshop at the beginning of each and every research and to get the feedback from local people before we define something. The next question, very briefly about labor cost was uh, it something where you have to take opportunity costs, as far as I know the term, right? We, we see what voluntary labor is invested, and we, we calculate it at the opportunity cost on, on the location. And that's very location-specific. In Ethiopia, when you go f far away from the road, people have to walk on foot. And that's 60% of the landscape, by the way. Um, and their opportunity costs are dropping to very immediately about one quarter of costs of the near towns. And so we also have a model of costing it according to distance from road to availability of labor because farmers are willing to work for much less theoretically. And in fact, they are working for free because there is also certain regulatory pressure from government, I must say government saying we need to do it and we are expecting from you to do it. The legislation said says if you don't care for the land, you may lose it. Land is government owned. And so the economic questions are really challenging for economists because they're not not as, as easy going as somewhere in Europe or somewhere where there is a lot of private ownership and all the labor is being paid and so on. Okay, I see that here you also have uh, some Indian gentlemen who would be happy to help you improve uh, 
the Ethiopian land. So you may want to take the opportunity uh, to consult uh, with uh, our Indian experts. Um, I would say at this point um, that uh, I would like to thank you uh, for this lecture again. I think that was a fascinating uh, presentation you gave today. If you um, stop now, uh, if you uh, may want to stay online for a couple of uh, minutes, we will be uh, able to take uh, some more questions. But for those of you uh, who uh, will have to leave now, um, I would uh, like uh, to introduce next week's speaker to you. Next week, uh, we will uh, hear from Dr. Daniel Plugger from the University of Hamburg and the Institute of World Forestry. Uh, and he will uh, uh, talk about the example of Madagascar and um, his um, uh, work on um, fighting land degradation and using uh, participatory evaluation methods. So next week will be uh, Daniel Plugger, University of Hamburg uh, Institute of World Forestry. So again, Thank you, uh, Hans. Thanks all of you uh, for joining us today. Uh, we'll take your uh, uh, questions to the forum and answer those who couldn't be answered uh, today. I'm looking forward to meeting you in the forum and uh, online and seeing you next week for uh, our um, uh, sixth live session. So again, thank you and bye bye. And I see uh, many of you are have already started their webcams. So.